morning, everyone. If you'd grab your hymn books and turn to hymn number 176 in times like these, hymn number 176 in times like these, based off of Psalms 42, 1 through 5, in times like these. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. Come on, I want to hear you. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. Come on, I want to hear you. On the third verse. Can you press start that over real quick? Come on. Like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. I'm very sure. I'm very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Come on now. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your rock is holds and grips the solid rock. Amen. All right, well, good morning. How's everybody on this fantastically bright and sunshiny day? No, it's no verdad. That is not true. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking Friday, just how good God is to us. If that would have been the weather, weather two weeks ago, just, you know, it would, it would have almost, well, I don't know what it would have done, but I was just really praising God for that. Friday was a mess, um, and praise the Lord. You know, God controls the weather, so... And, and it was funny because Pastor had mentioned this, that the week following, it was just up and down. 71% rain on Saturday, 12% rain on Saturday, 16% rain on Sunday, 90% rain on Sunday, no percent rain on Sunday. And Sunday was fantastic. Saturday, a little bit of rain up to about 8.30 in the, at night, and then it just dried right up. Fantastic. All right, so before we um, start, does anybody have something on their heart they'd like to mention? Good to see Josh. Yeah, you. Yeah, that, that Josh. The one behind Bob. Amen. So good to see you, Josh today. All right. Does anybody have a prayer request? All right. Anybody on this side? Now, what y'all do is you wait till I get over here, and then five hands will pop up over here. Okay. Anybody in the middle? Miss Bromley. All right. So you pray for Brother Dan Hatcher. His surgery is what date? Tuesday morning. Okay. So pray for Brother Dan, and we'll be praying for you, Brother Dan, if you're watching. Amen. And if you're not watching, we're not praying for you. No, I'm just kidding. No. So pray for Brother Dan that God will just correct this. Amen. All right. This side, anybody? All right. Miss Michelle? <laughs> All right. So Miss Michelle has one unspoken. Is that the appointment or is that in addition to? Okay. All right, and then the young family, uh, we continue on. We have two big unspoken requests that we need prayer for, um, if you would be so kind. All right, anybody? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do love you. God, we do continue to pray, God, for Pastor's health and that you would just um, strengthen his voice and uh, God, just help him to feel better. We do pray, continue to pray for Brother Mike Fell and those that are uh, not well and home. We pray for Dan Hatcher for his surgery, God, to go well, Lord, and that you just heal his... Uh, just heal Brother Dan, God, please. Um, we pray for Mr. Shell's one unspoken and the needs of that. And, Lord, I know in the church right now there are some folks that have some big needs, some big requests. 
And God, you know what they are. And I pray for each and every one of them. And of course, our two unspokens. And that God, just that your will would be done. We love you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see everybody. So how did Miss Hyatt's bridal shower go yesterday? Was it bridally? I don't know. You know, I've never been to a bridal shower before. Isn't that amazing? I ain't never <laughs> going to no bridal shower, man. Are you kidding me? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I've only been to one. Amen. Good. Oh, you know, brother. Yeah, my sister brought her husband to the bridal shower. Food? Yeah. Did you bring something to share? Get yeah, out, man. Just like it all happened. Okay. Amen. <laughs> all right. So, um, this is not correct. There will be a VBS meeting, not next Sunday, it's tonight. Yes, announcements for 30 April. So, okay, so let's just make sure. So the team meeting is tonight too then. Right. So there, okay, so the VBS meeting is tonight. So that's important. Brother, Brother Lewis, make sure you put that on there. So the VBS meeting is tonight at 430. So, so please, Brother um, Lewis, make sure you get that corrected this morning. So that is tonight, uh, especially if you're a, a ministry leader for VBS, we need you here. But if everybody will be here, that would be great because we're going to go over everything. What's that? It's in the bulletin. It's in the bulletin? Yes. Sweet. All right. And then tonight is the parent team meeting also, correct? Okay. So that is tonight after the evening service. All right. Now next, uh, May 5th and 6th, next Friday and Saturday, there will be a work party group at Camp Kaz. Uh, to see Brother Tim on that, just a lot of stuff we want to do to get the camp cleaned up for the coming summer months um one thing i'd like to put out that's not on here and you don't have to put that out in the morning well you can if you're on a cleaning team and even if you're not on a cleaning team if you use the church vacuum please check them check the bag because it will just okay so if if you could if you're a cleaner like if you clean toddlers if you clean anything check the bag we have replacement bags if you don't know where to find them Call Brother Harold, and he will tell you where they are. So if you could do that, that would be so great. Okay. Um, there will be, because of the work party on Friday, there will be no, due to the work party on Friday, youth group will be at Camp Cass. All right. And then Brother War will be with us next Sunday night during the evening service. And the end of the year homeschool chapel is on May 12th at 9 a.m., not 2 like normal. All right. Uh, please sign up so we can get an accurate number for dividing the children up into teens. And then there will be no youth group next week. Uh, I don't think that's right either. There will be no youth group the following week because of uh, Grace Schmidley's graduation at High Point Independent Church. So just see Mrs. Tell us on that one. So Grace Schmidley is, is graduating at High Point, and I don't believe that's this Friday. That's the following Friday. Okay. So is everybody crystal clear as mud on all that? Yes. Amen. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it all out. Bro Brother Lewis, like always, will fix it in the morning service. He'll correct all Brother Rich's errors, and life will be great. Right, Brother Lewis? Yes, sir. Amen. You were supposed to say no, man. <laughs> you said no, Brother Rich. You got it. Yes. <laughs> uh, we just agree that you ought to have it, Brother Rich. <laughs> <laughs> if you grab your hymn books once again, turn to hymn number 91, What a Day That Will Be. Praise the Lord that I get to work with Brother Rich, even though I didn't expect to be a song leader to be working with Brother Rich. I'm doing good. So, turn to hymn number 91. This one's from Revelations chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. 9 1, what a day that will be. There's a coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. The day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Come on, sing out on the second. 
There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, a glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. And I hope that excites you. I was reading this morning, just in my devotions, I was reading uh, Revelation, just uh, it's Revelation chapter 4, when the Bible says, and there was a door opened, and he brought me up, and I believe that clearly is the rapture, and what a day that will be, and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm just tired of doctor's appointments, and, and just all that mess, I'm tired of it, what a day that'll be, right Brother Ray? Amen. All right, all right, thank you. All right, Brother Ray will lead us in a uh, prayer for the Sunday school offering. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, the first thing I want to say, dear Lord, we have a good pastor, dear Lord. Amen. We got a pastor that loves us yes. and just has a burden for souls, dear Lord. And we pray for his health, too, dear God. Bring him back. We're strong, dear Lord. Thank you for Brother Rich, dear Lord, and the man of your word, the man that studies your word. And pray for this offering we should give. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, adult Sunday school class. Am I on? How is everybody? Are we awake? Hey, Amen. This is not a real one, but this is a plastic shofar. Everybody say shofar. Everybody say shofar, show good. This is actually, we're going to talk about this. Now, I actually have a real fake one somewhere. And I, they, I got these for junior church like years ago, and I, all I could find was these. But I've been actually practicing on this because they actually have certain ways they do it. I have failed miserably. Okay, here's the one. This, this one is supposed to be lo one long blast with like little machine guns after it. You know what that means? I have no idea. I haven't gotten that far yet. But it's something important. So today, as we jump into the Feast of the... Oh, that's me, isn't it? What did I just do with it? No, no, I don't need a pen. I need a little clicker. Where? Toothbrush. Somebody just handed it to me, too. Oh, thanks, man. All right. So, the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah. Don't say Rosh Hashanah. It's Rosh Hashanah. That's how you say it. Trust me, I've watched many videos on these things, all right? Rosh Hashanah, we're going to look at the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, the, uh, this is going to be what we call the Jewish New Year. That's when it falls. It falls in the Jewish month of Tishri. Okay, are you with me? I don't know how to say Tishri in Spanish. I imagine you just say Tishri, right? Okay. All right, September and October would be the, the Julian calendar or the, uh, the, the Gregorian calendar, I guess they call it. But the, our calendar, it would fall in September and October, and this would be what they call the Jewish New Year. Actually, there's a term they actually use. Um, understand that 
fall in the Jewish calendar is probably the most festive season of the year for the Jewish people. Fall into the early winter, fall into December. Um, very important. There's three major feasts that they celebrate. Uh, one of them is Hanukkah or Chanukah, but it's Hanukkah. You don't pronounce the ch 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 And even though that's not in Leviticus 23, we are going to talk about Hanukkah. Not today, of course, but down the road. Because that is, um, if you really want to win Jews to Christ, you ought to know some things about the Jewish culture. You ought to know some things about what's dear to them. You know, like Christmas really doesn't mean a whole lot to them, but it does. And I'll tell you why. Right now, my son is supposed to be reading the diary of Annie Frank. And I said, so how far are you? Well, um, well, Dad, um, he hasn't started it yet. And he's supposed to write a little book report on it. And <laughs> anyway, so we're doing a... But in his defense, it's just the diary part. It's not actually the book. It's the diary itself. And it's a diary, so it gets kind of boring. However, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff in there about what it was like to lose everything. To, oh, by the way, we found out today we can no longer go to school. We found out today that if you're Jewish, you can no longer have a business. And it, it's kind of a terrifying story. Um, but one thing she keeps mentioning in it is the, is the, is the Christian holiday Christmas. And she's, she wants to know a little bit more about it from, from what I've read. And she was supposed to get a gift for Christmas. So, so the Jews do understand what our Christmas is. So we ought to understand what their things are so we can witness to them. Can you imagine if you could just roll in and say, hey, I know what that is. I know what Rosh Hashanah is. I understand it. I understand how to say it. I know how important it is to you. So this is the Feast of, of Trumpets, okay? Also known as Yom Teruah, but we won't go through that too much. Rosh Hashanah means, now, now they call it the Jewish New Year, but it doesn't exactly mean that. It means the actual words, Rosh Hashanah, mean head of the year. That's what it means. It's not like our New Year's where, where it's a big sell, you know. It means the head of the year or the start of the year. Same difference. But the, oh, sorry. Is that how loud we are when I'm back? I, we're very quiet when we're back there. No? Hey, you know what? Pastor once said, hey, they're kids. Let them be kids. Now, if you notice, if you notice when your preaching is going on, I try to quiet it a little bit. And around the time you're doing the, the altar call, I had the kids totally go quiet. Listen, listen. For, I try. I, I try. I try. But then Miss Lisa gets a game going, and then she starts it all up, and it's her fault. All right. So Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, always falls on the seventh new moon of the Jewish year. This marks the agricultural year that the agricultural year has come to a finish. Okay. Now remember. This was really before they went into captivity. So a lot of their festivals fell on their harvest and coming into the new land. Like the Feast of First Fruits was their, their first harvest coming into the land of promise. Well, obviously nowadays they celebrate it a little differently now because they don't really you know, celebrate those things in that manner anymore. But they're still very important to them. So the Feast of Trumpets. All right. Okay. Now that right there is actually... What I want to get someday. I'm going to learn how to play that bad boy too. All right, ready? So this is called the shofar, ready? That's important. You know what that means? Yes, but it also means shut up, Brother Richard. We're going to kill you if you blow that thing one more time. All right. It's plastic. Work with me. But the shofar, and everybody thinks that's the, the uh, ram's horn, but it can be from different animals. But normally the shofar comes from a ram's horn. All right? This feast marks that the agricultural year has come to an end. <laughs> okay, so you guys, who was here for my, my message on Wednesday night when we were talking about Jay? Who? I couldn't, where was that coming from? That song, Say Boo. Say, I can't, why, why am I going, Jehu? Because it was that song, Say Boo. That's what that was coming from. I got home and I'm like, oh, what a moron I am. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, hey, hopefully you got something out of that message. So, you're not thinking about a, a Say Boo and a cow dancing during the night or whatever they're doing. All right. <laughs> All right, so the Israelites, okay. The Israelites now enter a sacred season, the fall season. So just understand that. Understand, like, that's why you see a lot of Hanukkah stuff come out of Christmas time. And people think that that's the Jewish Christmas. 
It isn't the Jewish Christmas because they don't celebrate the birth of the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah, which is sad because we, we have, and the funny thing is, it's their Messiah. I mean, it's our Messiah, but he was Jewish from the tribe of Judah, and all their scriptures point to him. But see, pride will stop that. That's why the Pharisees hated him so bad. I mean, they're preaching Messiah is going to come, and he's there, you know? So, anyways. All right, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is a very important time of self-reflection, or it's supposed to be. It is commemorated with trumpet blasts. All right, take your Bible, go to Leviticus chapter 3. Hopefully you've all read Leviticus 23 several times. In the last two months, who has read Leviticus chapter 23? You have to be honest, and I want to see a show of hands. In the last two months, since I've started this, who has read the book of Leviticus, chapter 23? Okay, don't raise your hand. Wow! You have failed, class. Now I'm going to say, who has it? But I don't want to do that. I want to keep you coming to my class. So, so you're, because, well, I haven't officially assigned it. So, by next Sunday, you all have to read Leviticus, chapter 23. Everybody say, okay, Brother Rich, raise your hand. Say, I solemnly swear to never swear. Again, okay. All right. All right, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, which is the month Tishri, or September, October, our calendar, the first day of the month ye shall have a Sabbath, of course, a Sabbath, a Shabbat, and, okay, a memorial of blowing trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no, no servile work, Therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And again, we're going to look at that offering again. You're going to say, Brother Rich, we sure are looking at the, basically what looks like the same thing. But it's not. And each offering is different. And each offering is expensive. And that's what an offering is supposed to be. It's supposed to mean something from you. Okay? Um, notice again, another holy convocation. All right? Now, in Numbers, if you want to turn there, you don't have to because I'm there. I can just read it. Numbers chapter 29, verse 1 through 6. And in the seventh month, or Tishri, all right? On the, and, and, and some Jewish calendars, they call it the month of Elul, but you don't need to worry about that. Tishri. On the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. Now, who can tell me for a candy bar, what is a holy convocation? Are you just afraid because you might be, even if you're close, you're going to get a candy bar? Joan, were you saying something? It's a holy gathering. It's a, it's a called out assembly of God's people for a holy purpose. Very good. I'm not doing this to mess with you guys. I, I promise. Pinky swear. Okay. All right. And ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. And ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And a young bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offering shall be offered uh, flour mingled with oil. Three-tenth deals for a bullock. A deal is about six pints. Okay. So there's a lot of flour involved. And one-tenth deal for one lamb. Okay. Uh, throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering to make an atonement for you, beside the burnt offering of the month, and his meat offering, and the daily burnt offering, and his meat offering. So in addition to the special offering, they were still supposed to do their daily burnt offering, okay? So the daily things they do don't change, okay? All right? Um, for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. So we see that this is a pretty big deal, all right? Now... Okay, let's talk about that here in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, now, but before, okay, so, I want to say something, blah, 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 blah. Okay, before we go on, I want to spend a few minutes with this thought. Okay, so we're talking about these offerings, right? All right, Bromleys, what is going on? Why are you laughing? Oh. Say something, blah, is that all you hear is blah, 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 blah? They got me in trouble Wednesday night with their fifth, sixth, seventh generation all the way back to the Civil War. I mean, come on. No, I'm just kidding. I love, you know what? I appreciate the Brahmies. They, they have fun with what they do. Amen. All right. So there's a word I just mentioned, sweet savor. Who would like to tell me biblically what that means to God? What is a sweet savor? 
The Bible says that this offering should be a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. Okay, so the word sweet is the, is the Jewish word at Nahoya, and it means a pleasant, delightful, soothing. And then the word savor is a fragrance. So these offerings to the Lord were pleasant, delightful, and soothing fragrances. Let me ask you this question. Is that, Brother Lewis, or anybody, is that what we offer to God? You know, when you, when you come to church on Sunday, now, I know that church sometimes becomes mechanical, but what is, the, what is the fragrance you give to God in your personal time at church? You know, I've been saved 32 years now or so. I've been coming to church pretty much that time. I've been in this church almost 30 years, and I still love coming to this church. I still love coming here. I love seeing new people. I'm not just saying that because if I didn't want to say that, I just wouldn't say that. Um, I love you people, some more than others. No, I'm just kidding. But I love coming. I love the things I get to do. I, I love getting to do vacation Bible school. It's still a sweet fragrance to the Lord. I love doing the things we do. But is that what your, your offerings are to the Lord? Are they a sweet savor or are they kind of more on the stinky side? Now, you don't have to answer that out, out loud, but God and you know the answer to that. That's why I'm just sharing that with you, okay? All right, so I have before... And we'll ask the question again, what do you offer to God and how does it smell? All right. Now, again, this feast, which I said is a pretty big deal, it begins, now, this is a new one you might want to know, Days of Awe or the Holy High Days. These are the, these next festivals we're going to look at, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, Yom Kippur, which is uh, Day of Atonement, which is probably the most serious of all the Holy Days. But these, these are what they call the Days of Awe or the Holy High Days, okay? And there are 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. These are considered the holiest days on the Jewish calendar, all right? The Feast of, of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, as I've mentioned, um, means the head of the year, and it, it's the beginning of the Jewish civil calendar, or the civil candle calendar in Israel. We would call it the new year, okay? January 1st is our new year, but they call it the head of the year, which is the same thing. But that, that is the term that they use, okay? Um, biblically, however, it was a solemn day with trumpet blasts to remind the people to reflect on their lives and repent. Because remember, they're getting ready to go into the Day of Atonement, okay? Which is Yom Kippur. And that's, I mean, that's not a party day. That's like, like we're about to see even this has feasts. And, and, and one thing that Jewish people are really big at in their festivals is, is feasting. And that's something Americans are real good. We've turned pretty much all of our big days into feasts. Um, Groundhog's Day, not yet so much, but 4th of July, man, Barbecue City. Uh, Christmas, come on. Easter, come on. You know, Halloween is a, is a, you know, one good thing. Okay, I'm not telling you to celebrate Halloween, but one good thing they got rid of for Halloween, and I don't know how we did it so many years, the most disgusting thing in the world, bobbing for apples. You ever realize how disgusting that really is? Whoever bobbed for apples when you were a kid? Bobbing for, you think about that. You're in there, you're ah, blah, 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 trying to get this apple in your mouth. And then the guy next to you sticks his face in there. And if you're the 19th guy, who knows what's floating around? In a, is that an apple or is that a liver? I mean, ma'am, we did survive. We did. We did. And we drink out of water hoses. Now, today, to do it, you'd have to wear a mask. <laughs> you have to, well, drinking out of water hoses, that's just American right there. Unless you're drinking out of it and an ant comes out of it and bites you on the tongue. I say that from experience, buddy. Oh, yeah. This ant just came right out and right on my tongue and bit my tongue. I'm like, I don't know. I was a kid. Probably not. Probably not. Don't get all technical. All right, so... All right, now these trumpet blasts were meant to signal to Israel that they were entering a sacred season, all right? Which brings me to our trumpet, which brings me to the shofar, okay? Shofar, show good, right? Al, where's Al? Al told me today that he, he had to drive himself because he couldn't get his shofar to drive him. That was good, Al. That was Al's. Come on, give him, give him a little clap offering for that. 
Sorry, buddy. I tried. Okay. Um, the shofar is the most significant and well-known custom associated with Rosh Hashanah, uh, usually made of a ram's horn. Uh, and the sound it makes, if it was a real one, supposedly resembles crying as it is blown in between the holiday prayers. It's, it's I think, supposed to be more of a l lamentful thing. And when I do it, I think it is very lamentful. <laughs> It feels lamentful for me doing this. But it's not, it's not like a cheerful sound. It's really not. It's like, like, put that poor thing out of his misery. All right? Uh-huh. Okay. Who would rather me not do that again for the rest of the message? Oh, now you raise your hands. All right. Now, this reminds us of the true meaning and importance of Rosh Hashanah. Um, now, there's a, a Jewish word called teshuva. Everybody say teshuva. And I say that because they're Jewish words. And this word means remembering who you are. So do you notice that not we're using the word reflection here? I believe before atonement and repentance, you got to have an idea of who you are. I'm stopping just to kind of give you a little bit of time to think on that. You know, before you really get right with God, you really need to spend some time in reflection of who you are. You know, today I was praying, and I just asked the Lord, I'm like, just, well, I'm not going to say the things, but there are just some things that I think I'm getting a little lack with, and I need God to kind of show me what they are. You know, I think sometimes we just have a, a, a little bit of reflection. Now, if that was played correctly, and there are actually men who play, I've watched some guys who, I mean, they, you know they know what they're doing, and there's a lot of heart into what they're doing, and there's, and I'll get to this in a minute, um, there's four. Here we go. Okay, so there's, so for my study, there are four main trumpet blasts. There is the tekiya, which is a single blow. It is a long, loud blast. Anybody want me to do it? Who would rather me not do it? Okay, good. All right. <laughs> there's a loud blow, okay. Um, if you ever seen a knight or a court messenger play a horn or a blow, a call to attention. That's what the tekiya is, all right. It brings people to attention. Okay, and I think that's a good thing in the Christian life every now and then, that God get our attention. There's the Shabarim, which is three broken blows of a, uh, sounds like crying, and that's what I was attempting to do there, was the Shabarim, I failed. Uh, no, no, actually I was doing the Teruah, which is a, like, sounds like a machine gun, it involves, involves nine or more blasts, okay. The, the, this, the Teruah, is the wake-up call for the new year, or the head of the year. Okay, all right, and then just, just, some, just some thoughts about it. You'll probably never remember these things again, but just understand that the reason, you know, we'll see pictures of this, but there's significance to what they're doing, okay? As mentioned already, the Feast of Trumpets, which falls on the first day of the Hebrew month, um, usually corresponds with the month September or October. Um, you know, and it wouldn't even hurt you to maybe now and then Google. Um, well, actually, this year, I already did it for you. Uh, this year, or maybe I did, maybe I didn't, it falls... On September 17th this year. So on September 17th, maybe just pray for Jewish people. Maybe maybe ask somebody. If you know a Jewish, does anybody here work with a Jewish person? Ah, nobody works with anybody Jewish? Really? Well, I don't either. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. So anyways, though, if you know any, just maybe talk to them about it, okay? Um, all right. So even though this feast day falls on the seventh month of the Jewish religious calendar, Okay, now, it was after the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem AD 70 when they began to call it Rosh Hashanah, and it be became part of the Jewish civil calendar. Remember, up to that point, most of their celebrations were based on their harvests, okay? After that, they weren't really based on the harvest anymore because they had no land. You know, my son asked me yesterday, mi hijo, we'll get you caught up there, my son asked me yesterday, and this, we just had the greatest conversation. We were, so we we're going to this, and I noticed he was, because I read better than him, and he even admits that, because I, I read faster. So I'm going through, and he starts asking me questions. He says, Dad, he says, because I, I, I was talking about Israel and the Jews going back in Israel. He says, what do you mean the Jews going back to Israel? Israel has always been the Jews. I said, no. I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, because I was explaining to him why they were in Holland in the first place, why they're in England and Spain. And, and, and I said, buddy, remember when, when Nebuchadnezzar, 
took over? He said, yeah. I said, they were dispersed out of their land. I said, it was called Palestine. It wasn't called Israel to 1948 when they went back in and started beating everybody up. He's like, Dad, I didn't know that. So, you know what? These, have some studies with your kids. You know, we seem, we seem to think everybody thinks that, but, you know, Israel wasn't Israel for like, I mean, it was God's promised land, but it didn't belong to the Jews for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years until 1948 when God started bringing them back. Um, but before that, so that's why Rosh Hashanah has a different meaning in a sense. That's why it's sort of different, okay? All right, so Rosh Hashanah leads up to, the Yom, to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which is the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. Uh, all right, so now let's talk about the offering again. See, Brother Rich, you're killing me with these offerings. Why, why do you make such a big deal out of them? I don't. God does. God makes a big deal out of what we offer. Right? Right, Alyssa? He does. All right. Poor Alyssa is just there. Nobody. So you kind of get called out when you... No, I'm just kidding. All right. So we'll start with you'll do no servile work. All right? Now, the, okay. So the book of Numbers, chapter 29, we see a great description. Again, and I, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about these animals. One young bullock. Do you know what I call a young bullock? Do you know what a young bullock to the Jews is to us today? A John Deere tractor. That's what a young bullock was. That was their John Deere tractor. Does anybody here have a tractor? A John Deere tractor? A, a tractor like a John Deere tractor. How important are they? They're pretty important. They can do a lot of work. If you've got to cultivate a field, you need a tractor. <laughs> you don't do that by hand anymore. A young bullock was, I would say, um, they usually weighed about 2,000 pounds, okay? They were like the John Deere tractor. So it'd be like you who has a tractor. It would be like you bring in your tractor and say, Lord, have my tractor. Do you understand? See, we make light of these offerings. And we make light of the offerings we give to God because we, we don't understand the value of what he, respect, he requests of us. Okay? Um, one ram, which is a male sheep, a symbol of strength and power. All right? Seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And a lamb was basically... I have here the three times a day's wages. Lambs were quite valuable. But they weren't just any lamb. Uh, they had to be a first year, a yearling, which, which I think was the best kind of lambs, I think, from my understanding. And they had to be unblemished. You couldn't just give God, well, give him Chico over there. Chico was kind of nasty looking. Got all these little cuts and bruises on him. Don't give him Fluffy. Fluffy's my boy. Fluffy's unblemished, one year old. Man, that's my boy right there. No, that's what God wants. God wants your boy. God wants your best, okay? Um, one kid of the goats for a sin offering. So there's a total of 10 animals to be sacrificed in this particular offering. And the Bible says, in addition to your daily offerings. So this was special on top of what you're already giving him. See, I think we have a God who's worthy of that. You know, I'm telling you something. 32 and a half years ago, I was not the guy you see here. Well, actually, I was half the man you see today. <laughs> Get it? Get, you see where I went with that? Okay, anyway. All right. But I was very different. And I thank God for what I am today. Um, I thank God for, I'm not saying I'm anything special, but I am certainly different than I was then. And that's all because of the grace of God. You know, me and Miss Lisa, on Monday, we went on the 30 year mark of marriage. That's a big deal to me. But that's the grace of God. The grace of God that, A, He, He, Gave me to my wife, and the grace of God, she hasn't killed me since that time. And I have challenged the poor woman, I'm sure. So I always joke around saying that she's the luckiest woman in the world, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't believe in luck, but that would be me. I'm, I mean that, okay? So we ought to think about what God has given us. That ought to reflect in our offerings. And I'm not just talking about our financial offerings. I'm talking about your life, your service for the Lord, okay? All right, now let's roll on. Okay, we'll probably be done maybe a little early today, but I probably won't start Yom Kippur today, maybe. Um, so we see this guy. The Feast of Trumpets today. So it is still celebrated today, very much so. And they still do the trumpet blowing, and they still dress in the traditional uh, uh, attire, okay, of the, of, the, of the ancient Jewish custom, I believe. Okay, and I don't understand all the Jewish customs, but I know a lot of people take them serious. We, we sort of think that the Jews don't take their religion serious, but many do. 
Uh, but unfortunately, it's more ceremonial. Just like we have a lot of Christians or, or Christian Christianity that doesn't worship Christ. There's a lot of ceremony in, in Christianity today. So that's another thing. We shouldn't let our service just be ceremonial, okay? Um, but there are some things that should never change. I was thinking about Vacation Bible School this morning. I was working on the, the, the things for tonight. and You know, I was thinking about just poor pastor. Every year he fights the devil. On day one, he never wins. You think after 30 years he would, he would, he would win on day one. But you know what? Why haven't we ever changed that? You know, we've done that. I have videos of us in the old building, pastor fighting the devil with the weights, same thing, lopsided muscles, because we have a different group of kids that come in here. And that is a, just, just, I think we, the fighting the devil every night, I don't think we should ever change that because we always have different groups of kids that come in there. And there's new kids like, that poor guy, is he going to win? Now, we all know, okay, just use your Bible. It's the... I'll give it away. The word of God. Now you know who it is. Okay, but there's no kids in here, so I could do that. Wait, did anybody not know that? What? I know. All right. So Rosh Hashanah itself is only it's only a two day long ceremony in itself. It is the beginning of the holy high days. It is the 10-day mark from Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, okay? Unlike modern New Year's celebrations, which are often raucous parties, drunk festivals, and they do drink, but they do have drunkenness, unkept promises, Rosh Hashanah is more of a subdued and complative holiday. Again, it is, you know how we always do, uh, I'm going to start a New Year's resolution. Re resolution? Resol no. Resolution. And we make it about four days, five if you're sincere, six if you're more sincere, okay? But theirs is, but theirs is more of a, they, they think about what they're doing, from what my study is, okay? Um, because Jewish texts differ on festival lengths, Rosh Hashanah is observed for a single day by some, but usually uh, two days by others. The sounding of the shofar, come on, I'm going to do it one more time. Ready, ready? Start a Rosh Hashanah, ready? Here we go. That's the start of shofar. Okay? Good shofar? Good. All right, amen. <laughs> All right. It is a wake-up blast and a sobering reminder that the time is near for the Day of Atonement. It is called teshuva, which means, comp com you know, thinking about your life. All right. These 10 days are one of great introspection, heart-searching, and self-examination. Say, Brother Rich, you've mentioned that several times. I have because we ought to have that in our life. Okay, so the primary theme of Rosh Hashanah is one of repentance. Uh, the Jewish tradition also includes wishing everyone a good and a sweet new year, okay, which we do, right? Uh, this is a common greeting. They say, blessing, may your name be inscribed, a wish for one's name to be written in the book of life. Now, stop right there. That's a pretty interesting statement. Um, one of the things they do, I think, they pray that your name will be written every year on Rosh Hashanah that your name will be written in the book of life. And that's a red flag right there. You know, 32 years. Let me ask you this. Let me see. Who can I throw? Let me see. Who can I mess with? All right. Let me see. Brother Miller, when was your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Okay. All right. Let me ask Brother Lewis. When was your name written in the book of life? Okay, now, your name was not written in the Book of Life on that day. Your name was sealed into the Book of Life. And I know where you're going with that. That's why I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. You'd be right. But your name is written in the Book of Life from the beginning, according to the Bible, from the beginning of time. Every Adolf Hitler's name was written in the Book of Life. For God would have all men to be saved. However, it's on the day of your salvation. What was the day again? June of 1926, in June of the year he said that his name was sealed into the book of life. You don't pray that somebody's name gets put into it. You know, I can't, I can't, I mean, I can't do nothing about Abby getting put into the book of life or, or Bob getting put in the book of life. You do that, okay? But it's not on Rosh Hashanah, okay? So, 
All right, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, on this day, Rosh Hashanah, they like to do this. They eat. I love festivals. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I cannot lie. Hi, Alicia. I cannot lie. My favorite. I love Christmas. Something about Christmas food. Do you know that chocolate, for some reason, tastes better during Christmas time? Has anybody ever noticed that? Chocolate tastes better. Okay, I have chocolate in my office, and it's good. But on Christmas, chocolate tastes better. I think God does something supernaturally to the chocolate. Amen? And to the ice cream. And to all food groups. All right? Party trays. Pepperoni trays taste better at Christmas time. They just do. You need to get right with God if you don't know that. Okay? But <laughs> one of the big things they enjoy on Rosh Hashanah, Jewish people still enjoy sweets on Rosh Hashanah. They, uh, one big thing is anything sweet, they dip everything in honey. Apples and honey, raisins, figs, and bom pomegranates. You know, has anybody ever split open a pomegranate? If they have what? They have those little seeds inside of them. You know, that I read, a, I don't know if this is true. I don't have the patience to do this. Count the seeds. There, somebody stated that there are 613 pomegranate seeds in a pomegranate. Do you know what that is significant to? How many Jewish laws are there? 613. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. It was made for good reading. I challenge somebody to cut. If you do, I will give you a gift card. First one who comes to me, who truly can. No, you can't just guess and say, oh, there's 393. You have to count them on your best attempt, okay? All right, if somebody can count that, see how many there, I will give you a gift card to Lone Star or something cool like that. Or not Lone Star, but... Um, Texas, yeah, okay. All right, now, in the eating of pomegranates, um, some Rosh Hashanah celebrants express the wish that their good deeds will be as numerous as the seeds of the pomegranate. And again, some say there are 613 seeds in the pomegranate, which is the number of Jewish laws. I don't know. I don't believe that to be true. So you don't really have to count. I will get, if you count 613, just stop there. That's cheating, but... All right, so they eat honey cake and honey carrots and, and others eat portions. Now, one thing they eat is the head of a fish or the head of a ship, a ship, a sheep, symbolizing the desire to be the head and not the tail. I'm not getting involved in that ministry. Hey, I'm not the biggest fish guy in the world, but I ain't eating no fish head, okay? If I eat it, it's going to be the, the nice white meat from the body, rockfish. It's really good. My son-in-law claims that snakefish, right, Leash? Snakehead fish, yes. Snakehead, okay. Well, it's a fish. Sounds nasty to me, but... All right, now listen to this. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 13, And the Lord shall make the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only. So God wants us to be the head of things, okay? All right, now... Okay, five more minutes. I got enough time. Jesus, now let's look at Jesus now in this great festival. Jesus. Oh, where, where did you... What? Where's my pit? I didn't give you the new. Well, I have a big picture of a trumpet blowing. It's just a trumpet. But All right, so let's talk about Jesus now. Remember, this is a Leviticus 23. So this is going to be a feast that points to Christ. We're in the latter end of them now. So these are going to be, um, these are going to be future events. All right? The, the significance of the feast. Who could tell me what you think the significance of the feast of trumpets would be? Take a guess. Anybody? All right, somebody has, to, somebody has to be bold. Who thinks they know what future event would represent, be represented by the blowing of a trumpet? Pastor, the rapture! Wow, come on, guys. Take a step. Step on out. Be brave. Now I know where Pastor's coming from. He says, come on, somebody answer this. Come on, I'm not going to make you look bad. All right, it is the rapture, the, the, the significance of Christ in this feast is the, the rapture and the resurrection of believers and the crowning of King Jesus. For those who have placed their trust in the atoning work of Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, their names are already written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're already sealed into the Lamb's Book of Life. Do you understand? That is the significance of this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump, of God, which tells us who we're supposed to vote for for president. No, I'm kidding. 
All right. And the, the last Trump, I always think that's funny, the last Trump shall sound. I don't think President Trump is ever going to stop sounding. I think in heaven, we're still, I think in heaven, if he's in heaven, hopefully he is, he's still going to be talking about that election. So, and the Lord, okay, Donald, okay, enough. It's over now. No more crying, no more tears. Let it go, buddy. But Lord, okay. He was huge. Okay. For the Lord himself shall shout, and with the trump of God and the dead of Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds. I love that verse. And, you know, the thing about that is you never know. You know, there are no signals. I mean, bam. You know what? You're going to be sitting at home eating a bowl of macaroni and cheese, and all of a sudden you're going to hear, <laughs> hopefully not that. <laughs> you're going to hear something like that, and I think it very well could be a shofar he uses, or maybe a regular bugle, I don't know, but we're out of here. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. So that is the significance of Christ, and Christ's significance in the Feast of Trumpets. They're still hoping their name is written in the Book of Life where we know we're, we're in it. If you're saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're sealed. You cannot be unsealed. And when that trumpet blows, you're out of here. And that is the Feast of Trumpets. Next week, we're going to look at uh, uh, Yom Kippur, which is the holiest. Not the funnest, but not everything in Christianity has always got to be woo, okay? So some things God wants our, our, our solemn heart on. And that was definitely going to be Yom Kippur. And then later, a few weeks down the road, we're going to look at a, a, a festival called, um, it's called Tishri B'Av. And it is the saddest day. It's, 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 the, it's, a, it's not a solemn, it's a sad day. They don't, there's no festival to this. It is an incredibly sad festival. And we're going to look at that. It's not really in the Bible, but it, 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 is, it is in the Bible. The events take place in the Bible, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at that. All right, we're done, 1030. Be back, be there, or be square, and get eaten by a grizzly bear. And I sure do appreciate the Brahmins. I pick on them, but they pick on me too. So. It's